Good morning. Welcome, everyone. This is an open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board on May 11, 2016. We want to welcome all of you who have joined us today in person or are listening to the webcast of this meeting. Today, the Board will take up a recommendation to repropose a standard that would provide additional information in the auditor's report. Before we proceed with the agenda, I will note for the record that all Board members are present. The first and only order of business before the Board today is a staff recommendation that the Board propose auditing standards on the audit reporting model. To present the staff's recommendation on this agenda item, I will turn to our Chief Auditor, Martin Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Board Members Harris, uh, Ferguson, Hansen, and Frenzel. The Office of the Chief Auditor is pleased to recommend that the Board repropose a standard, the Auditor's Report on an Audit of Financial Statements when the Auditor Expresses an Unqualified Opinion and Related Amendments to PCOB Standards to enhance the form and content of the Auditor's Report to make it more relevant and informative to investors and other financial statement users. The Auditor's Report is the primary means by which the Auditor communicates information regarding the audit of the financial statements to investors and other financial statement users. However, as currently designed, the Auditor's Report conveys very little of the information obtained and evaluated by the Auditor as part of the audit. And while the Auditor's Report has generally remained unchanged since the 1940s, companies' operations have become more complex and global, and the financial reporting frameworks have evolved toward an increasing use of complex estimates and fair value measurements. As part of the audit, auditors often perform procedures including challenging, subjective, or complex judgments, such as evaluating calculations or models, the impact of unusual transactions, and areas of significant risk. Although the auditor is required to communicate with the audit committee regarding such matters, this information is unknown to investors. The reproposed standard would, requ would require communication of critical audit matters that would inform investors and other financial statement users of matters arising from the audit that required especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment and how the auditor responded to those matters. We believe that critical audit matters are likely to be identified in areas that investors have indicated would be of particular importance to them, such as significant management estimates and judgments made in preparing the financial statements, areas of high financial statement and audit risk, unusual transactions, and other significant changes in the financial statements. The reproposed standard also includes additional improvements that are primarily intended to clarify the auditor's roles and responsibilities related to the audit of the financial statements and make the audit report easier to read. In a moment, I'll turn the floor over to Jennifer Rand and Jessica Watts to provide more information about our recommendation. But before I do, I'd like to express my appreciation to the many people within the PCOB who were essential to the de development of this reproposal. First, I'd like to thank the team that led this project, Jennifer Rand, Jessica Watts, Elena Boskova, Ekaterina Dizna, Karen Wiedemann in the Office of the Chief Auditor. And I'd also like to thank our colleagues from other divisions for their significant contributions, in particular, Andres Vanelli, Morris Mittler, Marcelo Pinero, Nicole Fanari, and Saad Siddiqui in the Center for Economic Analysis, Gordon Seymour and Jennifer Williams in the Office of General Counsel, Patrick Kastein in the Office of Research and Analysis, and our colleagues in Inspection and Enforcement. Finally, I'd like to thank the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission for their support and timely assistance with this project. Jennifer? Thank you, Marty. The reproposal before the board is supported by many years of outreach and research. <coughs> the PCOB commenced its standard setting project on the auditor's reporting model in 2010 with outreach to different stakeholders, including investors, financial statement preparers, and auditors. Since then, the PCOB has issued a concept release issued a proposal, held a roundtable, held a public meeting, and discussed changes to the auditor's report at numerous meetings of the PCOB's Standing Advisory Group and Investor Advisory Group. 
Additionally, the project has been informed by academic research and initiatives of other regulators and standard setters. With that as a backdrop, I'd like to describe the key provisions in the reproposed standard. First, and perhaps most significantly, the reproposed standard would require communication in the auditor's report of any critical audit matters arising from the audit of the current period's financial statements. Critical audit matters would be defined as any matter that was communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee and that relates to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements <coughs> and involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. To assist the auditor in determining critical audit matters, the reproposed standard includes a non-exclusive list of factors for the auditor to take into account in determining a whether a matter involved especially challenging, complex, or subjective auditor judgment. Examples of such factors include the auditor's assessment of the risk of material misstatement, including significant risks, the degree of auditor judgment related to areas in the financial statements that involve the application of significant judgment or estimation by management, including estimates with significant measurement uncertainty, and the nature and timing of significant and usual transactions and the extent of audit effort and judgment related to these transactions. The determination of a critical mat audit matter should be made in the context of a particular audit with the aim of providing audit-specific information rather than a discussion of generic risks. Finally, the auditor's communication in the auditor's report would include, first, the identification of the critical audit matter, second, the principal considerations that led the auditor to determine that the matter is a critical audit matter, third, a description of how the critical audit matter was addressed in the audit, and finally, a reference to the relevant financial statement accounts and disclosures. If there are no critical audit, matter, audit matters, the auditor would so state in the auditor's report. The reproposed standard also includes additional improvements to the current auditor's report, such as clarifications of existing auditor responsibilities, which would enhance certain standardized audit language in the auditor's report, including adding a statement about auditor independence and adding the phrase, whether due to error or fraud, when describing the auditor's responsibilities under PCOB standards to obtain reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatements. The auditor's responsibility with respect to fraud is not mentioned in auditor's reports today. The next improvement to the auditor's report is a required statement on tenure, which would disclose how long the auditor has served as a company's auditor. Currently, information about auditor tenure is not required to be communicated to investors by the auditor management or audit committee. However, there is a growing trend toward voluntary disclosure of auditor tenure. The intent of the reproposed requirement is to require consistent reporting of the duration of the auditor's relationship with the company and have this information be in a consistent location, the auditor's report. And finally, the reproposal would require a standardized form of the auditor's report, which would require the opinion to be the first p section of the auditor's report and require section titles to guide the reader. The reproposed standard would generally apply to audits conducted under PCOB standards. However, communication of critical audit matters would not be required for audits of broker-dealers reporting under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, Rule 17A5, investment companies other than the business development companies, and employee stock purchase, savings, and similar plans. I will now turn the floor over to Jessica Watts, who will describe how the reproposal is responsive to commenters' concerns from the 2013 proposal and what we've learned from developments of other regulators and standard setters regarding their new requirements for expanded auditor reporting. Jessica? Thank you, Jennifer. As Jennifer explained, the reproposal has been informed by comments received on the 2013 proposal, the 2014 public meeting, economic considerations, academic research, and international developments. While the concept of critical audit matters has been carried forward from the 2013 proposal, the requirements have been modified in a number of respects, including by limiting the source of potential critical audit matters to matters communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee, adding a materiality component to the definition of a critical audit matter, 
narrowing the definition to only those matters that involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgments, expanding the communication requirement to describe how the auditor addressed the critical audit matter in the audit, and narrowing the related documentation requirement. Additionally, the communication of critical audit matters would not be required for audits of brokers and dealers, benefit plans, and investment companies, except business development companies. The source of critical audit matters under the 2013 proposal was matters documented in the engagement completion document, reviewed by the engagement quality reviewer, or communicated to the audit committee. Commenters suggested that matters communicated to the audit committee should be the source of critical audit matters. The reproposed standard narrows this source to matters communicated or required to be communicated <coughs> to the audit committee. This source of potential critical audit matters would build on auditor communication requirements under other PCOB standards and would also include audit committee com communications that were not required. This approach scopes in the broadest population of audit committee communications. The reproposed standard adds a materiality component to the definition of a critical audit matter. Some commenters suggested limiting critical audit matters to matters that are material to the financial statements because they were concerned that the auditor otherwise may be required to communicate information that management is not required to disclose. In response to comments, the reproposed definition requires that the matter relate to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements. By using relates to, the critical audit matter could be an element of the account or disclosure and does not necessarily need to be the entire account or disclosure, or could be a matter that has a pervasive effect on the financial statements. The definition of a critical audit matter in the 2013 proposal <coughs> included those matters that involve the most difficult, subjective, or complex auditor judgments, pose the most difficulty to the auditor in obtaining sufficient appropriate evidence, or pose the most difficulty to the auditor in forming the opinion on the financial statements. Some commenters were concerned that including matters that pose the most difficulty to the auditor in obtaining evidence or in forming the opinion on the financial statements could lead to the reporting of unimportant matters or to misinterpretation by financial statement users that the auditor is uncomfortable with relating <coughs> accounting or disclosures. In response to these comments, the reproposed definition is narrowed to only those matters that involve especially challenging, subjective, or <coughs> complex auditor judgment. The communication requirement was expanded from the 2013 proposal, which required the auditor to identify the critical audit matter, describe the considerations that led the auditor to determine the matter is a critical audit matter, and refer to the relevant financial statement accounts and disclosures. The reproposal retains these elements. However, in response to commenters' suggestions, the reproposed standard also includes a new requirement for the auditor to describe how each critical audit matter was addressed in the audit. To meet this requirement, the auditor may describe the auditor's response or approach that was most relevant to the matter, a brief overview of procedures performed, an indication of the outcome of the auditor's procedures, or key observations with respect to the matter. Many commenters also stated that the communication of critical audit matters in areas where the company has no current reporting obligation can result in the auditor being the source of original information. That is, disclosing confidential information <coughs> about the company or effectively imposing a lower disclosure threshold than current management reporting requirements. The reproposal includes a note that indicates that when describing critical audit matters in the auditor's report, the auditor is not expected to provide information about the company that the company has not made publicly available, unless such information is necessary to describe the principal considerations that the, led the auditor to determine the matter is a critical audit matter or how the matter was addressed in the audit. Under the 2013 proposal, documentation would have been required for each reported critical audit matter as well as matters that appeared to meet the definition but were not determined to be critical audit matters and thus not reported. Several commenters expressed concern that the documentation requirement for non-reported matters was too broad and was not aligned with current documentation requirements. This, the reproposed standard narrows the source and definition of critical audit matters which should address some of the concerns under the reproposal, auditors would ha be required to document the basis for the auditor's determination whether each matter that both, one, was communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee, and two, relates to accounts and disclosures that are material to financial statements. 
involved or did not involve especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment. The amount of documentation required would vary with the circumstances and the auditor could comply with the requirements in a variety of ways. Under the 2013 proposal, the standard would have applied to the audits, con all audits conducted under PCOB standards. The re-proposal contemplates that the communication of critical audit matters would not be required for the audits of brokers and dealers, benefit plans, and investment companies, except business development companies. Some commenters on the 2013 proposal asserted that the value of reporting critical audit matters for brokers and dealers would be significantly limited by the closely held nature of brokers and dealers, the limited number of users of their financial statements, and the fact that in many cases only the statement of financial condition is available publicly. Investment companies, unlike companies whose business models can change over time, have specific investment mandates that are disclosed in the prospectus and rarely change. This creates the potential for critical audit matters of investment companies to become excessively repetitive, making them uninformative. Since a benefit plan's assets and liabilities aggregate the balances of all plan participants, the financial statements or related critical audit matters would not provide actionable information about a plan participant's specific investment. Further, given the nature of benefit plans, there is a chance that the same critical audit matters would be communicated each year. Overall, these considerations suggest that communication of critical audit matters may not provide meaningful information about these types of entities in the same way as for other issuers. However, auditors of these entities would not be precluded from including critical audit matters in the report voluntarily. The form and the content of the auditor's report has been undergoing change globally. In recent years, the IWSB, the European Union, and the Financial Reporting Council in the United Kingdom have all adopted requirements for expanded auditor reporting that go beyond the binary pass-fail model. While their underlying requirements differ in the details, there is a common theme in these initiatives, communicating information about audit-specific matters in the auditor's report. Although the processes of identifying these matters would vary across jurisdictions, there are commonalities in the underlying criteria regarding matters to be communicated and the communication requirements, such that expanded auditor reporting could result in the communication of many of the same matters under the various approaches. We recognize that the regulatory and market environments in other jurisdictions are different from the United States. Even so, we carefully consider the efforts undertaken in other jurisdictions and think that the reproposal is analogous in many respects to auditor reporting requirements recently established elsewhere. The reproposal reflects that consideration. The section by section description of the reproposal includes a comparison to the analogous provisions of other regulators and standard setters. We are also monitoring evidence emerging from implementation of expanded audit reporting, especially in the UK. The FRC published a report regarding implementation noting that investors greatly value the information provided in expanded auditor reporting. Overall, the experience in the UK to date seems quite encouraging, and we are hopeful that changes to the audit report will be well received here in the US. Jennifer? Thank you, Jessica, and yes, we do. In, in closing, we recommend that the Board issue the reproposed standard and amendments to PCOB auditing standards in substantially the form presented for public comment for a period ending August 15, 2016. The reproposal seeks comments on all aspects of the reproposed standard and amendments, as well as on the specific questions included in the reproposal. Among other things, the reproposal seeks comments on economic considerations related to the reproposed standard and amendments, including potential costs and on the application of the reproposed standards and amendments to emerging growth companies as defined under the JOBS Act. We are also requesting relevant information and empirical data to the extent available to commenters regarding the reproposed standard and amendments. This concludes our remarks, and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Bellman, Ms. Rand, <coughs> Ms. Watts, um, for that presentation. I uh, want to pause also to thank and acknowledge the staff who worked so hard and so long on this project. Um, as with any such significant project, we're talking about weekends lost, late nights, and very difficult, uh, very difficult schedules. In particular, um, I want to recognize Karen Wiedemann, Helena Boskova, Ekaterina Dishna, and the Chief Auditor's Office, 
Jennifer Williams from the General Counsel's Office, Patrick Caston in the Office of Research and Analysis, as well as Andres Manelli, Morris Mittler, Marcelo Pinero, Nicole Funari, and Saad Siddiqui in the Center for Economic Analysis. The new proposal before the Board today builds on our initial proposal to make the auditor's report more useful and informative to investors and other financial statement users. I'm grateful to the many investors, auditors, and others who took time to comment on the initial proposal. These comments helped us understand what is important to investors as well as what auditors are best able to deliver to them. Investor comment confirmed the importance of retaining the binary pass-fail option, the, the binary pass-fail opinion. But in today's complex economy, and particularly in light of lessons learned after the financial crisis, investors want a better understanding of the judgments that go into an opinion, not a recitation of the standard procedures that apply to any audit, but specific judgments that were most critical to the auditor in arriving at the opinion. While there's been promising experimentation abroad, describing those judgments in a way that is appropriate and most useful for dispersed share owners is new to the United States. Many auditors supported the goal to provide more informative reports, but in their comments they asked for more clarity on the framework for determining and discussing such judgments in the report. I believe today's proposal benefits from experience and appropriately addresses comments received. Most important, the proposal provides a refined description of what would be included as critical audit matters as well as a list of six factors the auditor should take into account in determining the CAMs to include. As with the original proposal, the new proposal envisions that auditors describe their critical audit judgments. It does not put them in the position of speaking for management. It does not put them in the position of speaking for management. But by focusing on auditor judgments, it does deliver on the Congress's intention expressed in Section 101A of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to further the public interest in the preparation of more informative audit reports for public investors. I look forward to public comment on this proposal, including on the economic analysis supporting it. I believe we have come to the right approach. Through this process, we have developed a solid foundation to be able soon to adopt final rules and move to implementation. Before I turn to my fellow board members for their statements and questions, let me say that today's vote could not have been achieved without the encouragement and support of the Honorable Mary Jo White, Chair of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission, and the active involvement of her Chief Accountant, Jim Schnur. To both, I want to express my thanks. I also thank the other SEC staff who worked on this project, as well as my fellow board members for their close cons consultation in this effort. Their assistance has been critical to help us bring this project to fruition. Finally, let me reiterate my deep gratitude to the staff of the PCAOB's Office of the Chief Auditor, the Office of the General Counsel, the Center for Economic Analysis, the Office of Research and Analysis, their indefatigable openness to research and analysis, and their tireless attention to detail have made today's action possible. I will now turn to my fellow board members for statements they wish to make, and we will hold questions until all board members have had a chance to make a statement. Then we'll have time for questions and discussions. Uh, board Member Harris. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I commend you, uh, the other members of the board, uh, and the entire staff uh, that you've mentioned uh, for moving uh, this project forward. Modernizing the auditor's report has been a priority of mine uh, since I joined the board in 2008, and I have given statements on the subject at the four previous open meetings. The need uh, for a new expanded auditor's report has also been discussed as far back as May 2010, March, and March 2011 at PCOB investor advisory group meetings, as well as at numerous standing advisory group meetings going back to 2010. The current audit report, as mentioned, features boilerplate language, decades old, that largely remains the same regardless of the risk a particular company might be dealing with or the unique problems that auditors encountered in facing and performing the audit. Time and again, Investors have asked for auditors to provide more information about the difficult parts of the audit, information the auditor gained from the audit, 
that he or she would like to know as an investor, and most importantly, those items in the audit that kept the auditor awake at night. Following the various reporting scandals that occurred at the beginning of this century, Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to establish the PCOB. The board's statutory mandate is direct, quote, to protect the interest of investors in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports, close quote. In pressing to assure that audit reports are sufficiently explanatory and useful to investors, we are simply doing what Congress charged us to do and expected us to do, namely provide informative reports, which is currently not the case in the view of most investors. The recent financial crisis demonstrated again the need for an expanded report. As the California Public Employees Retirement System noted in its May 2014 comment letter from 2008 to 2010, the auditor's report for a recipient of troubled asset relief program funds did not change while the audit fee increased by approximately 62%. Investors in that company had no insight into, quote, what additional work was necessary for the auditor to be able to once again provide a nondescript auditor's report. It's well past time that investors, the real clients of the auditor, who ultimately pay for the audit and depend upon it for its veracity, receive a report that meets their legitimate expectations and needs. PCOB action to address this problem is warranted even if no one else had already done so. Yet, as has been pointed out, the United States now lags behind the rest of the world in modernizing the language of the report. The Financial Reporting Council in the United Kingdom mandated in 2013 that audit firms provide expanded information in their audit reports. The European Union and the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board adopted their standards in April and September 2014, respectively. Now auditors of foreign companies issue two reports for the same audit an expanded informative report that is unique to that country in their jurisdiction, and a simple generic report in the U.S. For example, in the U.K., the auditor provides a more descriptive report as required under U.K. rules, but only provides the boilerplate three-paragraph report in the company's U.S. filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I believe U.S. investors deserve similarly informative reports as those that are now required abroad. In 2014, the board held a public meeting in the wake of the many reforms to the auditor's report that had by then been adopted in the United Kingdom and proposed by the European Union and the IASB. Various experts from outside the United States were present during the 2014 public meeting, including William Touche, senior auditor of Deloitte's London audit practice and leader of the firm's UK center for corporate governance. In discussing his firm's views on the expanded report, Mr. Touche stated, quote, we see the extended audit report as an opportunity to inform shareholders about the important work we do on their behalf. We are appointed by shareholders to form a view, and commenting on the major focus of our work now seems quite natural. I've carefully reviewed this reproposal I am pleased that it continues to require additional information about the auditor's independence, tenure, and responsibilities for fraud and financial notes. I support these changes as do the investors and investor representatives who commented on the 2013 proposal. However, I remain concerned with the proposed definition of critical audit matter, or CAM. In August 2013, while supporting the board's issuance of the original proposed rule regarding the auditor's report, I voiced concerns that the proposal was not strong enough to accomplish its purpose or to meet the needs of investors. I listed three reasons. First, the language in the original proposal endorsed a subjective standard of determining what is a CAM. Second, that the effectiveness of the new disclosures could vary depending on how plainly and directly they were written. And third, I was concerned that effective inspection and enforcement of compliance with a subjective 
critical audit matters standard would not be possible. The proposed redefinition or definition of CAMS limits the source of a CAM to any matter communicated or required to be communicated the audit report that one relates to material accounts or disclosures and two involves especially challenging, subjective or complex audit or judgment. I agree that CAM should include matters discussed with the audit committee. Under our audit committee communications rules, the auditor and audit committee must discuss those matters that are significant to the company in the audit. Therefore, it is appropriate and reasonable that the population of CAMs come from that source. The RISE definition, however, still contains an element of subjectivity. In my view, allowing auditors to decide what matters involved especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment still grants them too much discretion and the factors listed in the standard that guide the order in determining whether a matter meets these criteria do not help as they are subjective themselves. I had hoped that the proposed standard would be more objective so as to guard against the possibility of orders pursuing artful means to a providing information to investors. Further, my earlier concern about the possibility of effectively inspecting and enforcing compliance with such a subjective standard persists. If we cannot successfully apply our inspection regime to the new CAMS rules, and if enforcement proves difficult or impossible, this proposal will not be as effective as it otherwise could be. I believe that there should also be a precise list of matters that the auditor must discuss in the report, not unlike the European Union regulation, which requires auditors to describe, quote, the most significant assessed risks of material misstatement including assess risks of material misstatement due to fraud, fraud, close quote. As I noted in 2013, respondents to the PCOB Investor Advisory Group survey indicated a strong need for the auditor's report to contain a discussion regarding the auditor's assessment of management's estimates and judgments, a discussion of unusual transactions, restatements and other changes, and the auditor's assessment of the quality of the issuer's accounting policies and practices. The comments we received on the proposal from investors and investor representatives, including the investor panel at the 2014 public meeting on the auditor's report, continue to call for the inclusion of these items in the report. As noted by Jeff Mahoney of the Council of Institutional Investors at the April 2014 hearing, these items provide, quote, the kind of independent auditor insight that are more responsive to investors' information needs, close quote. I also share the concern that some commenters, or commenters have raised regarding including descriptions of audit procedures performed in CAMS. I am concerned that these descriptions could become too detailed and as a result make the auditor's report more complicated and difficult to read than it should be. Despite my concerns, I continue to believe strongly that expanding the auditor's report is essential in fulfilling the board's mandate under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. An expanded auditor's report would have been helpful to investors by providing them information that might have mitigated their massive losses during the scandals of 2001 through 2002 and the more recent 2007-2008 financial crisis. It remains a mystery how so many companies went bankrupt during these crises and yet received audit reports without a hint of any significant problems from their auditors. And I would note that it was the 2007-2008 crisis that led directly to the audit report reforms in the EU and the UK. Others clearly recognized and acted to address the need and problems associated with the old format of the report. Quite frankly, I would also hope that the expanded auditor's report would be good for the profession, not just the investor. As Mr. Touche noted in the UK, the expanded report has inspired the profession as it, quote, invigorates their personal sense of responsibility and pride and underscores to them why quality is so important in everything they do. As a leading member of the profession in the UK, he actively welcomed reform, and I would encourage the profession here to embrace the inevitable modernization of the report as well. Uh, in conclusion, today the board is taking a positive, though limited step in featuring investor protection by revising a clearly outdated, 
formulaic and uninformative auditor's report. The United States Department's Advisory Committee on the Auditing Profession proposed the idea in 2008, and after all these years of board consideration, I would hope that after hearing from all interested parties, we could vote on a final proposal by the end of the year. I see no reason not to do so. Uh, once again, I join you, Mr. Chairman, in thanking the entire staff who have worked so diligently and over the weekends and endlessly uh, to get to where we are today. And Mr. Chairman, I want to acknowledge your ongoing commitment and leadership to providing investors in the capital markets with a more informative, accurate, and independent audit report. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Board Member Ferguson. Uh, thank you. I have a written statement here, which I'm not going to read here, but I just want to start off by saying that, first of all, every time we do one of these things, I am aware of how profoundly in debt we are to the work that our staff does here. And the, on this one particularly, given the kinds of active uh, investor comment we've had, the academic work that's been going on, what's been going on in the world, your work in the office, and I'm not going to name people, but the office of the chief auditor, the Center for Economic Analysis, or a the General Counsel's Office and uh, even DRI here, your work has been just exceptional. And uh, I just I commend you for it and deeply thank you for it. I also want to thank uh, what the SEC has done here, as they, they always do, you know, to give us their thoughtful comments and to work with us, uh, both in the Office of the Chief Accountant at the SEC and in DURA there to, to, make the, to bring this uh, project home. One of the things that's interesting about this project is as we started it and we began to listen to the kinds of comments there were, the questions there were from investors, it was very clear that people were unhappy with the form of the uh, auditor's report as it existed today. But we faced a problem here, and one of the problems was how to give more information without treading on what is appropriately management's uh, venue, namely to the control over the financial information. So how do we tell what the auditor has done without stepping on what management should do and without indirectly changing the disclosure threshold, which is frankly not within our, uh, our jurisdiction? And I think what we've done here, and I think Jessica, when Jessica gave some of the responses to comments here, you could hear the difficulties and the complexities that were raised by many, many commenters, but I think what we've done here by basically focusing on things, if you will, that keep the auditor up at night. What were the problems that the auditor faced? We give a clue into the auditor's mindset, into the way the auditor thought about these problems. And that, in turn, I think leads a careful investor to be able to look at the financial statements, to think about the company he's looking at and say, okay, these are areas that I should look at. But we haven't treaded on management's a management's area of expertise, nor have we changed the disclosure threshold. And I think that threading that line has been a difficult thing. The second problem we had was so how do we avoid these disclosures from very quickly becoming boilerplate? So you simply read another formulaic disclosure that really doesn't communicate very much. And I think by tying the disclosures to fact-specific things in the particular audit, we will, I hope, prevent these disclosures from being boilerplate and will make them meaningless. Uh, I'm also delighted that this proposal brings us up to date with what's happening around the world, with what's happening in the UK, what's happening in the U EU with the IAASB proposal, and I think brings the United States back to a leadership position here. So with that said, I strongly support this proposal, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Lewis. Board Member Hanson. Uh, Thank you. Um, many of the points in my statement have been uh, covered already, so I'm not going to read, uh, read it word for word, but uh, I'll just comment that we've been on a long journey, and this is uh, another step in that long journey, and I'm looking forward to completing this, uh, this um, um, process uh, as well. I um, just want to highlight uh, some of the things that, that Jessica mentioned, that, that the, the feedback we got to our earlier proposal in 2013 included a number of criticisms, including the, um, the, the uh, broad scope of what could be considered a, a CAM, the uh, uh, lack of a materiality, explicit materiality filter, um, and as well as uh, the onerous documentation requirements. Um, and uh, the feedback we got from investors was, uh, was mixed, strong support on the project, but uh, some disappointment that didn't go, go far enough. 
So it's been a challenge to consider all these different uh, perspectives as we uh, come to this, um, this uh, point of reproposing today, but I'm uh, supportive of what, uh, what we have in front of us. Um, the narrowing of the definition of a CAM to, uh, uh, or narrowing of the scope to what was uh, communicated, required to be communicated to the audit committee, I think is a, is a good step because that includes the most important um, uh, challenging areas of an audit. So I don't think it's really scoping out anything uh, that is material to uh, in investors and is the right, um, right decision. Uh, the, the fact that we put in an explicit requirement that it be material to the financial statements, I think, is a positive uh, uh, step that addresses the uh, uh, concerns. And with uh, those couple things that we've done to narrow the, the scope, I think the documentation um, uh, requirements will be uh, substantially easier to comply with than the, um, uh, than the uh, original proposal. And with regard to uh, preparers and their concern about uh, uh, CAM disclosures being the source of uh, original information and uh, taking the place of management, I think we've, uh, we've appropriately uh, 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 calibrated and, uh, and emphasized that the, uh, that the, the uh, CAM should point to the management disclosures. And as uh, was pointed out by the staff, that it might be necessary to uh, share information about why something is a CAM that might not be explicitly disclosed. But uh, I would hope that um, the, the, the new information in CAM that's, uh, that's different from management's disclosure would not really be that, that, that frequent. Um, so overall, again, I, I support it. Uh, however, our work is not, not done, and as has been mentioned in the um, uh, other parts of the world, they've got projects underway and uh, standards in place, and, and uh, it's been interesting to watch what's been, been happening there. Um, the results from the uh, research analyzing the usefulness to investors of information provided in the expanded audit report are limited. Collectively, research results are ambiguous as to whether the expanded report have provided investors with new information beyond what's contained in the financial statements. So we'll continue to watch the evolution in the UK and other parts of the world where the IAASB standards will be soon uh, um, in place and, uh, and see what, what happens there. Uh, in the economic considerations a portion of the release, and I, I commend the staff uh, and all the hard work to translate economic terms into plain English, which I, I, um, I routinely have to sit and say, dumb it down a little bit more for me. I don't quite get what you're talking about here. And so I think we've uh, re reached a good balance of, uh, of economic terms and, and plain English. Um, uh, and uh, and, and we, we need to still hear more from investors on this. So. A perspective, though, is in addition to providing the information, the proposed requirements will increase costs and burdens on auditors, preparers, and audit committees, which we have tried to minimize with this. There, they, there may also be unintended consequences. Uh, so our goal, uh, therefore, can't be to merely reduce this information asymmetry by requiring disclosure of information, but making sure the information is valuable to investors uh, and justifies the, uh, uh, the related costs. So it is important that we hear from investors about whether they believe CAMs will provide relevant, helpful information and how the information is likely to be used. Is there value in highlighting certain aspects of the financial statements and related auditing challenges? Or does, or does doing so create a distraction from other important um, but maybe easier to audit areas of the financial statements that might not be communicated as a CAM? So really looking forward to that, that feedback. Um, uh, I support the, uh, generally support the other information that's being added to the report. Uh, however, on the auditor tenure, as I've expressed before, I continue to be troubled by that. Um, the evidence uh, about the impact of tenure on audit quality uh, continues to be mixed at best, and I share commenters' concern that, that requiring disclosure uh, of the tenure could lend credence to the theory that long tenures translate into uh, uh, poor audit quality. Um, and for those who believe it's relevant, I still think it's relatively easy to find and, uh, and the voluntary disclosures that are being uh, provided uh, for those investors expressing interest in, in, uh, in, in audit committee reports uh, uh, seem to be satisfying that need. So I'm still um, uh, holding out whether I will support that ultimately. Uh, with regard to the, the strong feedback we got, strong negative feedback we got from preparers of financial statements, um, I encourage uh, uh, them to uh, comment on this and, and uh, if they don't support the proposal um, to give us their feedback notwithstanding their lack of support about what would make it most useful to investors and, and how, how to best uh, operationalize it. And finally, in my formal statement, I, I would just uh, um, uh, again thank all the staff. I won't na name them all by name uh, as has been done several times here, but I appreciate all the work of our staff as well as the staff of the SEC. I'm going to close with a bit of humor. 
and I credit uh, our, our staff that found this, uh, this article from many years ago. And I'm going to read a poem about the auditor's report. The accountant's report. We have audited the balance sheet, and here is our report. The cash is overstated, the cashier being short. The customer's receivables are very much past due. If there are any good ones, they are very, very few. The inventories are out of date and practically junk, and the method of their pricing is very largely bunk. According to our figures, the enterprise is wrecked, but subject to these comments, the balance sheet's correct. <laughs> this goes back to an article published in 1951, uh, and, and the, 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 the author of that article was Ira B. McGladry, the founder of the firm that I worked for. So I appreciate the staff bringing this to my attention and the humor that this generates. Jeanette. Thank you, Jay. Board Member Frenzel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, after that, I think I'll sing a song about auditors. <laughs> Is everybody ready? <laughs> so I just want to say I support the reproposal before us today uh, to expand auditors' reporting to include critical auditors, critical audit matters, and other enhancements, other enhancements in the auditors' report. I'm pleased with how the staff has modified the definition of CAMs, the factors for auditors to consider when determining whether an issue represents a CAM, along with the other refinements in this proposal, including uh, the documentation requirements. Um, you know, the need to address the usefulness of the auditor's report has been longstanding, and I think the staff has done a tremendous job of, of analyzing a lot of competing uh, interests, a lot of competing um, views uh, to come up with a solution that should be workable and useful. Um, we do need to keep this par particular proposal, you know, in perspective. Um, the need to address the usefulness of the auditor's report is one of the many elements contributing to the long-standing and multifaceted expectations gap uh, between what investors and other financial statement users expect of independent auditors and what auditors deliver. So we can't expect this proposal to solve all of the problems out there uh, in terms of the expectations gap. So I just wanted to mention that to keep this in perspective. I believe, though, that this is a very significant step forward uh, in auditors' reporting, uh, but it is a small step forward when considering the overall expectations gap related to both auditor performance and reporting. And so we've got a lot more work to do, and, and we've got a, a robust agenda, and, and we'll be doing a lot more uh, in the future in terms of addressing that expectations gap. Uh, basically, unfulfilled investor needs and expectations related to auditor performance and reporting uh, can create, among other problems, inefficiencies in the capital markets and suboptimal incentives for auditors to carry out their duty to pr protect investors' interests and serve the public trust. Um, but I'm very pleased with the significant step uh, that we are making today. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the, uh, the requirements of the standard. We've already uh, done that, and I just want to reiterate how pleased I am with the solution that the staff uh, has come up with. Uh, there are also an awful lot of questions in this proposal because uh, we want to get it right. And so I'll be very interested in reading commenters' views on the definition and source of critical auditor audit matters, um, how the auditor addressed critical audit matters in the audit, uh, and, and also, we've gotten extensive, as, as others have mentioned, discussion of the potential benefits and costs of the revised requirements for critical audit matters. Um, and so I'm very interested in any other data or theories that the board should consider uh, when assessing the potential benefits and costs of this proposal, because this is very new uh, for auditor reporting uh, in the U United States. And so we want to be sure that we're considering uh, all of those uh, different um, facts and theories and points of view. I do want to call to attention uh, the reproposed requirement to include information about the tenure of the auditor in the standards auditor's report. Uh, this was also included in the 2013 proposal, at which time I expressed skepticism about the usefulness and appropriateness of including this data uh, in the auditor's report. I continue to have the same questions with this issue in this reproposal, as I've not seen additional uh, evidence or convincing evidence to indicate that this information should be included in the auditor's report. So I look forward to commenters' input uh, on this. Um, so again, I'm, I'm ha very happy that we've gotten to this point. I look forward uh, to the comments. I also want to thank all the staff. I know this has been a very long haul, um, and I hope that we can get to a final rule in the near future. Thank you, Jeanette. 
question time. Uh, should we start with Steve Harris? Stephen, questions? Uh, would you uh, please describe how the board's reproposal includes improvements uh, to those of the ISB, the EU, and the UK standards, and uh, how they are better, in your opinion, uh, for investors, and, and what, from your perspective, are the major uh, significant differences? Well, I'll start with that, and others can uh, chime in. But uh, first of all, uh, as was mentioned by, by board members, uh, there's been a lot of uh, improvements in auditor reporting around the world, and uh, so far the comments we're hearing from the Financial Reporting Council in the UK is that investors are valuing that type of information, and, and we're glad to see that. Um, we think that uh, all of the expanded audit reports uh, in, have a lot of similarities to them in the EU, the, 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 the principles there, and what the FRC has done, and, and actually now in the UK they'll be adopting the IAASB rules, and they've said that essentially um, they don't expect much difference in terms of um, different types of reports than what was previously reported under the FR FRC. So we think there's more similarities between what we're reporting, uh, what we're requiring with respect to the new audit report here in the United States and there are differences. Uh, the similarities are about, as, as you mentioned in your comments, the, the factors, the issues that get the auditor awake at night, and that's really what these expanded reports are about in each of the jurisdictions. And the, the important aspect is, and, and we give some examples of critical audit matters uh, in, in the release. The important aspect of this is that the information be informative and not boilerplate. It be specific to that particular audit and to the financial statement matters that, that are the critical audit matters that the auditor is addressing, and that the information about that critical audit matter include information that's valuable to an investor and to helping the investor consume the underlying financial statement information better because of what the auditor has put into the critical audit matter. So we think this will be a significant improvement with respect to the existing auditor's report. will help investors, as I said, consume other financial information better because of what the auditor says about that. And uh, we expect the critical audit matters to include robust information about the, the matter that was being addressed and how they addressed it. Um, again, I think, again, there are also more similarities than differences, and we're looking forward to what we hear in the way of comments uh, about the proposal. Jennifer or Jessica? Okay, thanks. Others? Other questions? Lewis, any questions? Yeah, I have one question here, and this is going to sort of ask you to speculate a little bit, because you've provided some illustrative examples of how a critical audit matter could be communicated in the auditor's report. Do you foresee a wide variation in how firms will describe CAMs? And, and this is a two-part question. One, within particular firms, and two, among firms. How much variation do you foresee in what, uh, what, what this stuff is going to look like? Well, again, I'll start. Uh, best source of that answer is really, since expanded audit reporting has already taken place in the United Kingdom, uh, that, that gives us some indication. And there, in the first year, there was quite a difference between uh, one firm that really took this very seriously, and I would say all the firms took it seriously, but one firm in terms of putting really meaningful information that we want to see in critical audit matters, the types of information that they were putting in the report got into substantial detail about the matter, how it was resolved, and, and expressed their observations about, about the issue. Um, some other firms, their responses to the initial FRC proposal were good, but a little bit more standardized and for not providing exactly the same information. That was noted. That was noted by analysts in the UK who, who really saw the difference between the quality in some reports versus others. The second year of implementation over there, we've seen more and more expanded reports that include greater information and maybe an increasing similarity in high quality. Um, We'll, we'll have to see here. Again, you know, we have to look for comments first, but we, we're clearly sending a message here that it's, it's not boilerplate information, and what we're looking for is a discussion of matters that are specific to that audit, not generic issues, matters specific to that audit, and then how the auditor addressed those matters, providing informative information to investors that can help them then look into the financial statements in a better way. And what about within firms? Do you see the firms sort of trying to mandate standardized language within their firms as a way to create uniformity? Certainly, I think firms will provide guidance and uh, provide um, 
uh, training about critical audit matters and, and guidance about how they should be addressed, about their methodology as they do with respect to all aspects of their, their audits. Um, but hopefully that would encourage, not discourage, it would encourage the audit teams to do what investors are looking for here, and that is to provide audit-specific information and not standardized language job by job. Others? I don't know what I just found. The UK's experience to me has been very interesting and informative because they have, they're in their third year of expanded auditors reporting. Um, one thing I found very interesting is that investors have given out awards to auditors for their audit report. I would love to see an Academy Award ceremony for auditors reports in the United States. I think that would be awesome. I'd be ready to be on the red carpet for that event. Um, They've given out of awards to auditors for um, in two categories um, and in different size of companies' reports um, for kind of like best supporting actor, actress, et cetera. But um, they've given out awards for most innovative audit reports, the same auditors' reports that have used charts and graphs in structured ways and informative ways, really tending away from kind of boilerplate language, and also um, ones that have provided great information, the informativeness kind of, again, away from boilerplate. So a for really content and how that was presented. And the FRC themselves have commented on the use of charts and graphs and presenting information in different ways so that it's not boilerplate and they found that, it, um, that auditors have done a good job. So my hope is that while there may be some guidance that for firms within, you know, within a firm want to have um, some type of structure or presentation or how that would look for, for a firm's branding of itself, but they are um, within the firm itself having um, really tailoring for each, for each audit. So, so our hope is that we would see that same type of innovation, informative in, in, in auditors' reports in the United States, and we think certainly the standard would lend itself to that. We're very much looking forward to investor comment, but hopefully the analyst community would drive high-quality expanded audit reporting and if you will, punish those reports that come out very well, those firms that issue very boilerplate type reports and award, reward those auditors that are providing valuable information to investors. Jay, any question? I'm going to put Andres on the hot seat uh, from the economist perspective in just a second, but uh, Marty, I just wanted to, to have you confirm one, one, one thing that I, don't, I didn't hear you mention. Maybe you said it and I didn't. So our original 2013 proposal included uh, a proposal relative to reporting on other information and what the auditor did what, what relative to all the things uh, uh, not in the financial statements like in, in the end report to the 10K. Uh, but I just want, want you to confirm for everybody listening that, that this proposal, this re-proposal, does not include that element uh, right now. That's correct. The 2013 proposal included uh, the expanded audit report but also addressed uh, whether what the responsibility of the auditor should be with respect to other information accompanying the audited financial statements uh, in, in the 10K, management's discussion and analysis, uh, other uh, risk factors, et cetera. Uh, right now, there are responsibilities for the auditor to read and consider that other information and whether there's a material inconsistency in that other information with the audited financial statements or while reading it, whether there's a material misstatement of fact in that other information. We are considering whether we should expand the auditor's responsibilities around that other information, which can include very significant matters such as non-GAAP measures. So that continues to be on our agenda to look at that and determine uh, what kind of responsibilities beyond those today auditors should have, but we are not reproposing that today. Okay. So, uh, Andres, from, from the economist's viewpoint, kind of if you could distill down some of what the economic analysis is, uh, what, what do you, what, through an economist lens, what do you see the biggest benefits uh, of this to be in terms of uh, serving the needs of investors? Um, the biggest benefit stems from addressing the information asymmetry between the auditor and the investor. Uh, to understand why this is important, one needs to step back and think about the investors' needs. Uh, they do not know as much as uh, other um, actors do about um, what's going on in the company financial reporting process in particular. Uh, the proposal in, uh, envisions the um, auditor's reporting to include critical audit matters uh, that, as um, or member Ferguson um, remarked, provide a glimpse into the auditor's mindset in terms of especially challenging subjective and complex aspects of the audit. The reduction of information asymmetry between investor and auditors should in turn reduce the information asymmetry between investors and management uh, concerning the company's uh, financial performance. 
this reduction could result in benefits stemming from changes in the behaviors of the older people uh, involved. Uh, for example, CAMs could lead to auditors focusing more closely on matters identified as CAMs. In turn, management, uh, management uh, could improve the quality of disclosures um, because they would know that investors and the auditor would be scrutinizing more closely these matters. Uh, in turn, audit committees could focus and engage more effectively uh, with both the management uh, and the auditor about the matters identified in, in CAMs. And finally, investors might perceive and respond to references in the quality and usefulness of the uh, CAMs uh, discussed. Uh, these changes uh, in behavior may ultimately be uh, resulting in enhanced audit quality and ultimately in higher financial reporting quality. Board Member Franchel. Thank you. I also had some questions uh, related to what Jay just asked, but I want to really follow up uh, then on, on that issue of benefits to investors. Um, we tend to use the term investor generically, uh, but there are a lot of different types of investors out there. And so uh, can you talk about some of the relevant economic and behavioral theories that you all considered when putting together the economic analysis uh, as to how different types of investors uh, will benefit and, and how their behavior might change as a result of this proposal? Sure. Uh, we have tried not to speculate too much in the release about um, future behavior. It's very difficult to forecast. But um, we believe that, that at least three salient functions um, will happen um, around CAMs, that those of informing, framing, and monitoring, helping those three functions. So let me start by informing. Um, the identification of the matters uh, themselves considered challenging, subjective, and complex together with a description of how it was addressed could provide information that, uh, that would be useful, for instance, about the company's business environment or about the financial reporting choices made by, by management. Um, second, on framing, um, CAMS could provide investors with a new perspective on the financial statements and focus their attention uh, on the related financial statement accounts and disclosures, which could facilitate their analysis of the financial statements and help them assess financial performance, for instance, by reducing the search costs and the information costs. There's a lot of disclosure, so how, how do investors compute all that? CAMs may perhaps help. Finally, on monitoring, the, the ability to identify and evaluate uh, CAMs might also help investors and analysts um, engage management with targeted questions about decisions and support mm -hmm. investors' decisions on ratification. Now, of these three functions, which ones will help different type of uh, investors? Let's get into that. I personally hypothesize that the first two um, functions will be most usefully, uh, useful for small uh, retail individual investors. That is the uh, idea of informing them and framing. Uh, they have limited, I believe, capacity to absorb all the information out there as opposed to large investors. So the functions of informing what's on the auditor's mindset and framing that information, I think it would be valuable for, for individual investors. Now, if we move to larger uh, institutional investors, I believe that monitoring becomes more critical. Okay? The proxy voting is a big deal for them. They take it seriously. Camps could provide some information uh, with regards to ratification of the auditor, and also the engagement of the direct engagement with management um, and through uh, financial intermediaries such as sell side or research uh, research analysts, that those functions could be more pressing and important for larger institutional investors in that uh, monitoring. Um, we have asked specific questions in the release about these matters, and we're very, very interested in what um, um, many stakeholders have to say about these matters. One of the um, features of our board members lending themselves to one or two questions as we go around until questions are uh, exhausted. Um, Steve? You yeah, I had two questions. Um, uh, the first is, how are emphasis paragraphs and, and going concern treated in the IASB's uh, standard as compared to those in, in the reproposal? Um, so the IAASB has um, separate going, um, 
I'm sorry, are you talking about emphasis paragraphs? And going concern. And going concern, okay. Um, so they also have Bozer separate versus ours. going concern reporting, as do we. So ours is under, our going concern reporting is under explanatory paragraphs, and it's required when there's substantial doubt about the um, company's ability to continue as a going concern. Um, if that is um, the standard of which we are, there's a going concern paragraph, there could certainly be a CAM. We could see in many cases that there would be a CAM related to going concern. Um, and the IWSB um, has the same type of structure where if they're, they would say that a going concern paragraph almost always would also lend itself to being a key audit matter. So in that um, situation, we're the same. As, and so they also talk about in situations where there are um, matters that are close ongoing concern, that those may end up being um, key audit matters. But it's not really about the close call. It's about the underlying information um, related to the financial statements and the audit. And that's, we've said similarly that, that if there's a pervasive effect on going concern, you could have a critical audit matter. And how about with respect to emphasis paragraphs? Um, so emphasis paragraphs are not required. They are um, allowed in our standards in situations in which the auditor would like to highlight a matter in the financial statements. And if the auditor would like to highlight something in the financial statements related to going concern, but in those cases, the management would have normally already had to have a going concern discussion in their financial statements for the auditor to also highlight it through an emphasis paragraph. This standard didn't change how emphasis paragraphs work in our standard as they are today. You may have one more time, but I don't know whether you want to go back and forth. Good. Um, Jay, you yeah. go, we'll come back. Uh, yeah. So we've we, we touched on the, uh, the um, what would actually be reported in a CAM. Uh, a couple of board members have, uh, have questioned that. And, and in, the, uh, in the release, there will be a couple examples. And I appreciate how difficult it was to get to those, uh, those examples. And, and uh, if you could just maybe talk us through a little bit uh, the concern that, that, gee, do these become the checklist of, gee, we, everybody can write a CAM just, just like these. And, and, um, and that is not what we intend. But uh, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. And also, maybe what you see as, as the range. Uh, so, so each of these CAMs we describe is maybe about a page long. But, um, but I'm just wondering if some could be, for a simple situation, much shorter than that. For a complex situation, maybe much longer than that. So just talk a little bit about the examples. I think, well, I think with the examples, you know, the, the UK, again, we've studied those, those reports a lot. And we, see, we do see a lot of ranges. And I think it's all facts and circumstances dependent about, about the situation, what the auditor's done in response to that. The UK is kind of a similar framework, although they use different words. But really it's identifying what the, what the matter was, what the auditor did, did in response to that. So we do see variations with that. Um, we really do not want our examples to auditors to look at those and, and say that's going to be the template for what we've done. I, I have at least heard anecdotally that when we had included examples in the 2013 proposal um, and there was some um, a limited some f um, field testing by some firms or a limited impl implementation trial that those examples are kind of used as a roadmap. We really have built the standard to be principles-based, a framework, and we really want auditors to think about and really think about their facts and circumstances and tailor it to the, to the audit that, that it would apply to rather than trying to use what we've done as an illustration. Um, so we have that in there as a starting point, but certainly we don't want that to be a roadmap. We've even considered back and forth, would it be helpful or not to include examples because of a hesitation that we did not want auditors to just look at that and, and then apply that framework for everything. Really want what we see happening in the UK for auditors to be innovative and, re and really tailoring it to the approach. So that's, that's really our hope. And we think our standard, again, is a framework-based approach so that auditors can apply it as they see appropriate. I'll just add, and I agree with everything Jennifer said, it's, but I, I do think that we send messaging here through these examples that they are not intended to be boilerplate at all. They're intended to be very specific about the facts of that company and the issue in that company and the issue, the issue in the audit of the financial statements that they're addressing and, and to include enough information that this is now new valuable information about the audit that should help 
for the reader uh, better understand the financial statements now that they've understood this CAM. Um, yeah, you explained it in the release, but for the listening audience, uh, would you describe why brokers and dealers are, are not included in the CAM? Well, essentially, uh, there are no brokers and dealers that are publicly held. Um, some of them are subsidiaries of large companies, but their ownership is still the, uh, the, uh, the company itself and not outside shareholders. And for most broker dealers, they're held by very, you know, one or two individuals who, um, so it's, they are very familiar with what the auditor's done. Uh, there isn't the information asymmetry because investors are sitting on the outside and not on the inside knowing what's going on. Um, the owners of broker dealers are getting this information as part of the communication they have regularly with their auditor, and therefore this wouldn't provide those owners with new information. Oh, I have no further questions. Um, the economic analysis point, um, I think, can be revisited in one in one sense. Uh, information assembly being a very broad concept, um, I'm impressed by the extent in this release to which you you come to a very full analysis with laden with scholarship about the implications of information asymmetry, which go down below the areas that most of us think about, Andreas, and, and uh, it was a, a revelation to me the extent to which economic theory, well-established economic thought, considers that there are moral hazards involved in information asymmetry that, that harken back to the savings and loan crisis and what we saw there. And the agency, the pressures on agents to deprive the uh, some of the principles for which they are agents of complete information become very uh, very significant. Uh, you want to do you want to speak briefly to to that point um, in the release? What does it mean? Well, we'll do that. It's very interesting that you mentioned the savings and loan uh, crisis. In that, you know, we that was a, a very clear antecedent to where we are today, even though we haven't mentioned it uh, this morning, I believe that prior to the crisis, there were a lot of calls after the SNL fiasco, series of fiascos, uh, and one of them was where, where, what were the auditors actually doing, and there was no information that this was coming and all that, while this moral hazard in, in part uh, uh, by management of different SNLs was happening there. I think that's something that, that we haven't mentioned yet this morning, but I would add to um, to, um, to board members Harry's prepared remarks the fact that SNL seemed to be a very clear driver for action. So I'm very glad personally that we are taking on this this project after all these years. Well, unless there are further questions from the board, uh, I would ask that all in favor of approval. Well, actually, I would just yeah. you know I, I would a second Andre. Right. First of all, I, I think your presentation yeah. was excellent in terms of, of uh, the uh, information symmetry. I didn't mention it, but I was part and parcel. I started my career uh, as a chief counsel in, in the, at the uh, on the Senate Banking Committee, and uh, the SNL crisis resulted, in, I think, in 132 billion dollars worth of losses for investors. Uh, and whether it be Chairman Dingell or uh, uh, at that time Congressman Wyden and others. Uh, that uh, resulted in quite a debate uh, in terms of and, and of taxpayer orders. money too. And taxpayer, and taxpayer money. money too. That's why I mentioned the 132 billion. Thank you that's, very much. That's not a question, but if 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 Board Member Hansen is allowed a recitation of a poem from the founder of McGladry, I think you're allowed to <laughs> on the SNL crisis. And I will then ask that all, all in favor of approving this recommendation, please say yes. I, yes. yes. It's approved. Uh, those opposed, hearing no no's, the votes are unanimous. It concludes our agenda. There's no further business. Thank you. Thank you. The meeting is now adjourned.